speaking now. Lord, be upon the word. And Father, in my weakness, be strong in your strength and touch your people. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the name of Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world and the glory of Israel. Amen. Amen. Now, I have about 2,000 messages and teachings, and one of which is the harbinger. And so I thought, let me do something different, uh, which I was going to do the mystery of the Malkosh, which is about the end times, the rains, and a whole thing about the mystery of the age. Um, and I thought, well, so people are going to want to know about what's happening with the harbinger. So I planned, okay, let me do a little bit of that. And then, so I started on that, and then it became like two messages. And so I had the harbinger. And, the, and then as I'm doing this, I ended up, I'm doing the harbinger. And there's so much that's happened. It ends up, well, I ended up having 118 pages of notes before I came here. I said, so I think we're going to have to hold off on the mystery of the Malkosh, okay? Maybe next year, because there's so much to share. But I also believe it's very important what I'm going to share now about what is happening. The ground is shifting. The times are rapidly changing. A lot of times, a lot of subjects that we get into, that you get into as people who love prophecy, which is wonderful, a lot of times it doesn't always have a direct application or we don't always have a direct way we can apply it. And there's also many theories concerning the end times, and a lot of them don't pan out. But tonight I'm going to get into a mystery, end time, that is something that is literally affecting you every day, and that has every application. First, to set the stage for those who don't know what is the harbinger, because before we move on, we have to at least set that in a nutshell. The harbinger is the revealing of an ancient mystery that is behind what is happening now in America, so precise that it actually gives dates and times of events that are happening. It actually gives the words that American leaders speak before they speak them. It begins 2,000, and well, basically almost 3,000 years ago, in the days of ancient Israel, the last days of the kingdom. Before its judgment, there manifests nine harbingers or nine prophetic signs in the land, warning them of judgment. But the people of Israel disregard it, and they continue in their path of defiance against God. And so they, a number of years are given to them. They refuse to turn back. And then in 722 BC, they are destroyed, wiped off the face of the earth. And the stunning thing or the scary thing or the amazing thing is the same nine harbingers are reappearing on American soil. Some in New York City, around which we are. Some in Washington, D.C. Some in the form of objects. Some in the form of events or even rituals with the highest leaders of the land, even the President of the United States. And it begins with a calamity falling on ancient Israel years before its destruction. The first sign is always the Lord allows an enemy to make a strike in the land. It happens to America on September 11, 2001. That's where the harbingers begin. And it's linked to a vow that ancient Israel did when they first had the strike on their land, the warning strike. Instead of humbling themselves, they make a vow. This is the key to the harbingers. Isaiah 9, 10, they said, the bricks are fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down in this attack, but we will plant cedars in their place. And from this come the nine harbingers. Now, we don't have time to even scratch the surface of the nine harbingers today or the mysteries in the book, except to give just some brief mentions. The fifth harbinger, for example, is called the Gazit Stone or the Stone of Judgment. It will appear, it will appear three years after 9-11 on the pavement of ground zero. And American leaders will gather around it and pronounce vows of defiance over it. The sixth harbinger is called the sign of the sycamore. And that is manifested on 9-11, the striking down of a sycamore at ground zero at the corner. There is a prophecy that the, basically, the leaders of ancient Israel actually pronounced judgment on their land by actually saying this vow in Isaiah 9.10, the bricks have fallen. On the morning after 9.11, the American government gathers on Capitol Hill, and one man is appointed to give America's response. 
And that is the Senate Majority Leader, out of his mouth on the floor of the House of Representatives, he pronounces the ancient vow of judgment, word for word, Isaiah 9.10, that literally identifies America as the nation in defiance of God. And from this, and then comes, and we're just, you know, you know who know the book, I'm just, just scratching the surface, but yet, so you have a framework. Then comes the second shaking, a shaking not of buildings, but of American power itself, the collapse of the American economy in the year 2008, which in the Harbinger opens up another stream of mysteries. One is called the Isaiah 910 effect. One is called the mystery of Buttonwood. The other one, the mystery of the three witnesses. We don't have time to get into that, except I'll mention one of them, which I get a lot of questions about at a conference like this. It goes back 3,000 years and beyond to the sands of Sinai, to Moses. And that the one day, there's a day appointed on the biblical calendar when all financial accounts are wiped away from the nation of Israel. And this day is called Elul 29. On that day, the nation's financial realm is wiped. Credit is wiped away. Debt is wiped away. And and it comes once every seven years. It's based on a seven-year cycle. This is called the Shemitah. It was to be a blessing, but as Israel moved away from God, the Shemitah, this blessing, turned into a sign of judgment on a nation that has driven God out of its life. So here is the seven-year cycle. The first shaking happens at 2001. The second one, the financial collapse, happens 2008. That's a seven-year cycle. But the crescendo in 2008 happens on the day of September 29th, 2008, the greatest crash in American history. When did the greatest crash happen in Wall Street? It happened on the exact, precise day appointed in the Word of God to judge a nation that has driven God out of its life and that strikes the financial realm of that nation. It was Elul 29, the crowning day of the seven-year cycle. And actually, when you go back seven years from that crash, you come to another crash, you have the other greatest crash in American history, which happened on the exact same biblical day. The two greatest crashes to those days happened on the exact same Hebrew day, Elul 29, happened on the exact day that's appointed to strike the financial realm of a nation. There is nobody on earth who could put that together. Only the hand of God. And it happened eerily. It happened down to the hours. It is so precise. And so so that's why people ask me, okay, what about the next one? I'm not telling. Okay. (laughs) Then there is the mystery ground before we move forward when simply this, the, the pattern is that when judgment came to ancient Israel, the destruction returned to the ground where the nation was dedicated to God, consecrated to God, the Temple Mount. And it's a prophetic warning. Well, when you go back in American history, there's a day when America began as a fully formed nation. When Washington is sworn in as president, he puts his hand on the Bible and gives a prophetic warning to the nation, which is coming true in our day, of what happens if we ever turn away from God. And 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 what happened is, after that, the entire first government of America walks on foot from, from the place of the inauguration with Washington. They go to a place appointed to dedicate this country to God. And that is the dedication of America. That's the dedication ground. Where was it? It was the capital city. It was not Washington, D.C. The capital was New York City. Where in New York City they dedicated America to God? At ground zero. The ancient mystery returns to the same ground, the same place, and the warning that God is giving. And there is so much, I'm just touching it for those who have not read it, to say there's so much to say of this in the book, but what I want to share is something else or link to this. Because the harbingers have not stopped. They have been continuing to manifest since the book came out. In fact, what is in the book has been coming true to the point where when I heard about some things, I didn't believe it and I wrote the book. But I don't take, I don't take credit for the book. Because what's taking place in America, and really Western civilization, but America has not stopped. The mystery of the harbingers is not just about the appearance of harbingers. The mystery is also about the course of a nation in danger of judgment. The harbingers appear to a nation that is progressing in apostasy to judgment. And end times, we know, well, you know, there, there's the mystery of where is America in all this? Well, here is America now. There's a timing to it. There's warning comes before judgment. The harbinger came out in 2012 at the very beginning of the year. That same year, that same year turned out to be a real tipping point in what's happening around us in America. 
When the harbingers appeared to ancient Israel, the nation didn't repent. They defied God. They moved farther and farther until they were destroyed. What has happened to America since 9-11? Since 9-11, America has not moved closer to God. I think we can all agree on that. It has moved much farther from God. It has moved in apostasy. After 9-11 was a move actually to take the words under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance after 9-11. And in more than one presidential address, quoting the Declaration of Independence, the word God was mysteriously removed from the speech. Within the first days of the new administration, American policy was reversed on abortion. Overseas, an order was signed. America would now endorse the killing of unborn children around the world. Under the new government, the month of June was proclaimed Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender Month. And Americans were told to celebrate homosexuality from the White House. It is progressing. The, the comes, then comes the removal of the ban on homo, open homosexuality in the military, which is now teaching classes, which is now endorsing it, and having soldiers, gay soldiers, marching openly in gay pride events. The Secretary of State then made a declaration the U.S. would have a new foreign policy. We would endorse gay rights around the world, pressure countries that are opposed to homosexuality. Laws have been passed which, if fully enforced, could declare certain preaching of the Word of God illegal. Other laws were in the works that could force Christian ministries to hire those who practice open homosexuality. It's not just the federal government. When 9-11 took place, there was no state in the union where marrying a man to a man was legal. Now there are several. Interesting, it began and spread from New England, the land of the Puritans. The Harbinger came out exactly that beginning of that year, 2012. That year was a tipping point. The tipping point is defined as the moment of critical mass, when the dynamic changes, when things begin to speed up or accelerate, like tipping over a chair. When the Harbinger was released, this was a year of tipping points. For the first time, the number of Americans against the biblical definition of marriage passed 50%. When just a few years before, it was a clear majority against it, only a third of people were for that. And for the first time, the president came out for the redefining, really ending the biblical definition of marriage. It's estimated that of the younger generation, 30 and below, 70% are for ending the biblical definition of marriage. And this is a generation bombarded by propaganda from school on. And is over every year, just if we did nothing else, if it just the old age out and the new comes, it will keep changing. On television, there are things now we could never imagine would be on television years ago. Through the internet, pornography has spread over the nation. To the point where it said every month, at least two out of every three American men are watching pornography. And as immorality comes out of the closet, the pressure grows for believers to go into the closet. You know, th this was the a president of a major fast food chain. A Christian was the subject of media attacks and boycotts for simply saying, I believe in traditional marriage. That's it. That's where we have come. Something that would never be possible before. And those who have no real moral or spiritual grounding just switch their positions without any real reason for it. Where just recently, a petition by a number of Republicans and conservatives was sent for the Supreme Court to redefine marriage. And of course, the White House was led, led by a man who a short while ago said he's wrestling with the issue. As a Christian, he cannot be for it. Suddenly, he switched the position. What happened to being a Christian? And now, sending a message. Now, in this year... 2012, or last year, in the recent Democratic convention, the word God was removed from the platform, as was the word Jerusalem. When this came out into the news, it caused a backlash. They attempted to quickly do damage control. Yet when they put the motion of God to vote for God in Jerusalem, some of you saw this, it was clearly booed throughout the convention. I mean, the, the boos were as, certainly as strong as any support. And that convention won the popular vote, and then came the election. And the election, this is not about a person or a party. This is about God and where we are. And for the first time, several tipping points, a president who said, let's end the biblical definition of marriage, was reelected. And not just that, for the first time, a state, not one, but count three states, ended the biblical definition of marriage in one election. By margins of 48% to 52%, 49%, 51%. This is a tipping point. 
And there's more talk of the end of the influence of Christians on America's future. And then came the inauguration, during which for the first time, a president enlisted the entire nation into the gay agenda. Speaking of Stonewall, a violent riot in a gay bar with violence against police officers, he put it as the course of America. This is part of the proud heritage. The president said, we are following a star that has guided us. What star? Interesting, there's one in scripture who is called a star, but he's not good. (laughs) The inauguration was also noted for the removal of two words, where it should have appeared under God was removed. And for the first time, in effect, a Christian minister was banned from praying. In the public square, because two decades earlier, he had said what the Bible said is sin. For the first time, for believing basically in the Bible. The year 2012, it came out for the first time in America, Protestants are no longer in the majority. And largely in the Protestant realm comes those who are born again, statistically. The same poll found the number of people who said they have no faith at all has multiplied. And those under the age of 30, one out of every three, will say, we're we're not a Christian at all. I'm not a Christian at all. Not not nominal, I'm not a Christian. One third of America, well, one third of the future of America, and some say it's more like four out of 10. That's 40% of the future. The age of what could be called Christian America is rapidly ending. And now over 40% of children in America are born with no marriage and often no father. And of adults, the future is, if you're 20 to 30 and you have kids, chances are, 50% 50% of the children will not be born without, will be born without marriage. Since that election, that tipping point, there's come a major accelerating developments. The Boy Scouts of America, a group that took much attack for their stand on marriage or, or gender or, or homosexuality or morality, they start to crumble. Another organization, Exodus International, a Christian ministry that helped get people out of that lifestyle, made a public apology to gay and lesbian groups for its ministry and closed up their ministry. They made a study of the media comparing news stories that are for gay marriage and those which are against. They found that the ratio was five to one for gay marriage. The chief umbrella just just about a month ago for American pediatricians, that's doctors who deal with your children, told all American pediatricians on their list to put out pro-gay materials in their office for the children so that the children can be exposed to it. Meanwhile, abortion continues unabated. Millions of children are continually killed in their mother's womb. And for the first time, the government has begun to force or to try to force Christian organizations to actually pay for abortions. And even in the realm of foreign relations, America's relation with Israel has never been as strained as it is now since it has been from the beginning of Israel's rebirth. And just last month, the Supreme Court issued a decision That was momentous. For the first time in American history, the Supreme Court ruled homosexuality and homosexual marriage to be constitutionally protected and labeled the view that this is wrong as demeaning, humiliating, and harmful. In 1996, Congress voted to protect traditional marriage and the definition of marriage by upholding at a federal level a union of man and woman. Wouldn't seem to be too controversial. The Defense of Marriage Act. No, but not to, but to a Christian nation. I mean, even to an Islamic nation, that wouldn't be controversial. But to a nation in spiritual apostasy and free fall, marriage becomes controversial. In the 1996, the Defense of Marriage was voted with overwhelming numbers of Congress. A vote of 342 to 67 in the House. Even the Democratic Party, it was overwhelming. Overwhelming. And yet when it was struck down a month ago, its striking down was hailed by a chorus of Democratic leaders, the same leaders who had voted for the very act they were celebrating its destruction. The leaders were symptomatic of a spiritual schizophrenia in America, an apostasy. So too was that declaration, presidential act that said, June, we're all to celebrate homosexuality because the bottom of the act, it closes with, in the year of our Lord. The Supreme Court just began the overturning of thousands of years of human morality, overturning the word of God. They did what the prophets warned Israel never to do. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Never in human history has there been such a moral transformation changing, taking place on this planet. 
And the Bible says it will happen. And the change has one precedent, though, not in, not in speed, but in action. And that is Israel, that knew God and turned away from God. Imagine living in the days of the prophets, when a nation that had once known God was now turning away from God, was calling what it once said is good, evil, what it once said is evil, good. You don't have to imagine because you're there. The days are now. We are witnessing a transformation a war against the very things that America was founded on. And it wasn't just what the court ruled for. You need to know. It's what the court ruled against. Anthony Scalia the other, wrote for the other Supreme Court justices who said no to this. And he said this. What, listen to his words. He said, it's one thing for a society to elect change. It's another for a court of law to impose change by judging those who oppose it, hostis humani generis, or enemies of the human race. This is, not, this, this is not a radical newsletter. This is a Supreme Court justice saying that what the decision did, in effect, is declare those who are against the redefining of marriage or for marriage as we know it in the Bible, enemies of the human race. Ultimately, that's talking mostly about people who believe the Bible. You see, you cannot redefine sin without redefining righteousness and the righteous. When a society calls evil good, they will start calling those who are good evil. And they will call the gospel evil. And those who follow the gospel will be called evil. It is worthy of note, after the ruling, how many times on the internet the word hater came up for simply those who said, marriage is a man and a woman, which everybody said a number of years back. Just a few years back, it was, it was two, it was, it was, well, a few years back, it was two viewpoints. Then it was the, before that, majority viewpoint were for marriage as we know it. Before that, it was the overwhelming. And before that, nobody said anything else but that. Yet now, if you simply hold to what has always been, you're called a hater. There's no way around it. What they're saying is Paul is a hater. Peter is a hater. The Virgin Mary is a hater. And Jesus himself is a hater. Ultimately, the Supreme Court is warring against the word of God and telling everyone else to do likewise. It is a new America. Where the profound, if the profound is treated as holy, or the profane is holy, then the holy will be profaned. Years ago, you would never see God or Jesus being used as part of a joke on television or comedy. Never. But you see that now. It's no accident. It's the other side of this movement, which is to war against God. A post-Christian America, ultimately an anti-Christian America. It was only tolerance, everybody said tolerance, for a season. It's enough tolerance to introduce this, which is against the Bible, whatever it is, whatever form, the goal is ultimately the end.